All right, first graders, I'm back with the very last chapter of Tall. I so wish we were in school and that I could read this chapter to all of you guys out loud as you were getting comfortable on the rug because this is my very favorite chapter in the whole entire book. And sometimes when I was reading out loud to kids, I would cry a little bit in this chapter, but I think I'm going to be able to refrain from doing that since right now I'm just reading to a computer. So <clears throat> chapter 19, Nooms or Noom and the story of the great giant Bunga. Four men had told their stories and all four had failed. Nooms or Noom was left alone waiting for the trumpet to sound. He lifted one corner of the golden cloth that covered the crystal block and whispered to Tall, We are going before the king now. The other storytellers have failed and have all been thrown into prison. If I don't open the golden door, you and I are lost. But no matter what happens, you must keep absolutely quiet. The king must never know that I have brought you into Trump. He never will, said Tall. I won't make a sound. Are you sure you're not too cramped? asked Nooms or Noom. I have lots of room, said Tall. I like it here. Then the trumpet sounded. Nooms or Noom put his arm around Millie Tinkle's neck, and together they walked into the throne room. When the courtiers saw the old man come in with his donkey, they burst out laughing, for they had never seen such a sight before. But the king was in no such humor. He was angry. He said, Who are you, Nooms or Noom, that you come before me with a donkey? I could do nothing else, your highness, said the old man. My stories are written on this crystal block. The block is too heavy for me to carry, so I brought it here on my donkey's back. Your stories, said the king. What do you mean by those words? I only asked for one story. Then Num Zarnum told the king about the stories, how he'd collected them and written them down on a crystal block. He said, I'm going to read you the best one of all that I have heard. Whoever said anything about reading a story, said the king beside himself with rage. My orders were that you tell one. I know it, said Nooms or Noom, but... But nothing, said the king. You have disobeyed my orders. You know what the penalty is for that. I could not have learned them all by heart, said Nooms or Noom. There are too many. That makes no difference to me, said the king. My orders are my orders, and you should have obeyed them. We will only waste our time. It will do no good to read the story, not even if it's the best in the world. The golden door wishes to have the story told. King Tazarin was so angry that he had about made up his mind to have the guards throw Nooms or Noom into prison right away. At that point, Millie Tinkle flapped her ears, the golden bells tinkled, and she said, O oh, king, please let my master read his story. It will open the golden door. Then she dropped a curtsy and stood looking at the king with her eyes wide open. The king was so amused at the sight of a donkey that could talk and curtsy that he forgot his anger. He said, that is a wonderful donkey you have. How did she learn to talk? I'll tell you, said Nooms or Noom. And while the king and courtiers listened, he told them about Millie Tinkle and the Snow Queen. The king was so pleased with what the old man told that he said, if your stories are as good as that, you may read one. But that doesn't alter the fact that you have disobeyed my orders. Therefore, if you fail to open the door, you must pay for your failure with your life. If you are willing to accept this condition, you may read your story. So that means that if he's going to read his story and it doesn't open the door, that the king is saying that they would kill him. Noom Zornum thought for a moment. Then he said, I am willing to pay whatever penalty you exact. It makes no difference. Millie Tinkle knelt down and the old man lifted the crystal block off her back and set it on the floor in front of the throne. He pulled back one corner of the golden cloth, just enough to uncover the story he wished to read. He left the rest covered up. Then he himself sat on the floor and read the story of the great giant Bunga. Get ready. Once a mountain named Car that lived at the bottom of the sea began to grow. It grew and grew until it was so tall, it stuck its head right out of the water. After that, it grew some more, so that to all the world, it looked like nothing but a very high island. But it was different from most islands, because it was made of pink coral, 
and because it rose from the surface of an emerald sea. The sun always shone on Carr. The weather was always warm, and the many miles of beach that ran around the island were covered with smooth pink sand. Sounds pretty wonderful. Along the beaches, and for quite a distance up the slopes of Carr, grew thousands of penteca trees with slender trunks and big silvery blue leaves. From their branches hung the ripe pentecas, a sweet, juicy fruit, the size and shape of a coconut and the color of a pearl. These pentecas were all that the people of Carr had to eat, yet they wanted nothing more, for one penteca was enough to keep a man from being hungry for a year. Wow. So every spring, when the fruit ripened, each islander ate his penteca, and after that he ate no more until the fruit again became ripe the next year. For this reason, the islanders had no food to grow and no cooking to do. All day long, they played on the pink beach, swam in the emerald sea, and stretched out under the warm sun that poured down on the marvelous island of Carr. No one knows how long the people of Carr lived this happy life. One day, however, a black speck appeared in the sky far out over the sea. As it came near, it grew in size so that it soon looked like a big black cloud. The islanders, who had never seen anything of the kind before, ran to the beach and stood gazing up into the sky. At first, they were held in wonder, but this soon changed to fear, and all they could imagine was that a horrible monster was coming to eat them up. The more they looked, the more frightened they became, especially when they saw the black shadow of the monster skimming directly towards them across the calm waters of the sea. They watched as long as they dared, then all but the bravest ran and hid among the branches of the penteca trees. Those few who stayed on the beach huddled together, waiting to see what would happen. Nearer and nearer the cloud came, until it was directly over the top of Carr. There it stopped and hovered a few feet above the highest point of the mountain. So thick and so black was the cloud, that it shut off all the sun and cast a deep shadow over the whole island. The next minute, it lowered and touched the peak. When it lifted again, the people saw the huge figure of a giant sitting on the mountaintop. Then a voice like thunder roared and said, Happy people of Carr, you shall share your happiness with me. Behold, I am the great two-faced giant whom people call Bunga. Here I shall stay and eat your pentecas until a man or woman of Carr is brave and strong enough to beat me in battle. And as he spoke, thunder clapped, lightning flashed, and rain poured down on the island. When the rain began to come down, even the brave men and women who had stood on the beach ran to shelter under the penteca trees. And a great fear seized the heart of all the people of Carr. What can this mean? they asked one another. What have we done to deserve such punishment? They peeked out from under the leaves of the trees, hoping to see that the cloud had gone. But all that day and the next, the rain poured down without stopping. And not once did the sun shine on the island of Carr. On the third day, Bunga shouted, If fifty men, each carrying a penteca, will come to me, I'll stop the rain. First, the people did not know what to do. Then they decided to take the fruit to Bunga. So 50 men each picked a penteca. They balanced them on their heads, and slowly they made their way up the mountainside to where the giant sat. Just as they reached the top of Carr, the rain stopped. Bunga greeted them kindly, saying, I have not come to harm you. I have only come to share your happiness. Do not be afraid. But how could the people help being afraid? For Bunga was a sight to see. He was a huge giant, and his body was all covered with blue hair. He wore a yellow shirt studded with shark's teeth, and in his hand he held a club. Instead of one face, he had two, so that he could look both ways, behind and in front, at the same time. I wish as a teacher I had two faces, one in front and one behind. I could always be watching you. His eyes were fiery red and his mouth was big enough to hold a whole penteca at once. When the islanders saw him, they stood trembling with fear. Not one of them dared to say a word. Put the pentecas right here, said the giant. 
remarked, pointing to a spot on the ground in front of the boulder on which he sat. The men did as he told them. They piled the pantecas on the ground and waited to see what the giant would do. Fine, he said. Just what I want for breakfast. One by one, he put the pantecas in his mouth and swallowed them whole. And without stopping to chew or speak, he ate up the whole pile of fruit in the wink of an eye. Then he smacked his lips and said, I'll have 50 of these every day. And every day you bring them, it won't rain. But if you don't bring them, it will rain, and I shall keep my cloud over the island so as to have it ready in case I don't get my pentecas. Once a year, at the time of the ripening of the pentecas, I shall fight your bravest warriors. If a warrior can beat me, I shall leave. If not, I shall stay for another year. That's all I have to say. You may go. The people walked away and went down the mountain and joined their companions. As soon as the rest of the islanders heard what the fifty had to say, they became sad. They did not know what to do. If there were no sun, the pentecas would not grow. If Bunga ate fifty every day, there would not be any left for anyone else. We shall all starve, they said. How can he mean that he has not come to do us harm? And they went about their business sadly, for there was no more joy in their hearts. The sun shone no more on Kar. The pentecas grew badly. Only a few of them ripened, and these few were saved for Bunga. The people lived on green fruit and were sick. No one played on the beaches, no one swam in the sea, no one laughed, and no one sang. Every day they took the fruit up the mountain, and once a year they sent their bravest warrior to fight Bunga. Always they were beaten, for the giant was strong and his club was heavy, to say nothing of his being able to look in two directions at once. Though the people of Kar always fought bravely, they could do nothing. Bunga just laughed at them and jeered at them and ended the fight by seizing the Islander's club, snapping it in half, and sending the man or woman home with these words. If there is no one stronger than you, I shall stay here forever. This is an easy life. Then there would follow another year without sun. For five years, the people lived in this misery until they did not care whether they lived or died. About that time, there were twins on the island of Kar. They were both boys, and their names were Ingenog and Engenog. They looked so much alike that no one could tell them apart, not even their own mother. They always lived together and played together, and they spoke a language of their own. When it came time for a man to be chosen to fight Bunga at the end of the sixth year, Ingenog went to the people and said, this year, let me fight the giant. I am not strong, but I think I can beat him. The people were surprised and said, What makes you think you can beat the giant? He is strong and you are weak. He will only laugh at you. You may as well send no one as you. You can do nothing without your brother. Perhaps not, said Nganong, but no one else has been able to do anything. Let me try. If I fail, you may cut my head off. If not, I shall ask for nothing. When the people heard how earnest he was, they decided to let him fight the giant, but they had little faith in him, and some even went so far as to laugh at the boy, saying that he was young and foolish and thought too much of himself. But Ingenog paid no attention to them. He went off and joined Egenog, and together they made ready for the fight. Ingenog spent days making as heavy a club as he could swing, and though the people did not know it, Enginog was making one, too. He might be making a prediction. I wonder why the brother's also making one. After that, the twins went off where no one could see them, and they practiced using the clubs until they both became very skillful. Time passed. Only one day was left before the fight. That night, while the rest of the islanders slept, the twins went secretly to the place where the men had piled the pentecas that were to be carried to the bunga in the morning. With great care, they opened each penteca, cleaned it out, and filled it with pebbles. Then they put the fruit back together so that not even the sharpest eye could see that a single penteca had been touched. This they did, and then they went home to sleep. In the morning, Enganon came to lead the men up the mountain. Enganon was not to be seen. No one knew where he was. The men and women who carried the pentecas complained how heavy they were. It's your own strength that's failing, said Ingedong. 
and the men really believed what he'd said. Up the mountain they went and piled their fruit in front of Bunka. When the giant felt the pentecas, he was pleased and said, Your fruit has ripened well, and he ate it all with an appetite. Then the time came for the fight. Inganag stepped forward while the others stood by to see what would happen. Bunga got up, but he was so full of pebbles that he moved slowly and with much trouble. The minute Inganag advanced to attack him, Inganag appeared from over on the other side of the mountain. So much alike were the twins in every way that the two-faced giant thought he was only looking at one person. This confused him. How could the same person be in front of him and behind him at the same time? He rubbed his eyes and looked more carefully. And every time he looked, first Enganog struck him, then Enganog. Bunga turned this way and that, but always, no matter what he did, one of the twins was attacking him from behind and the other from in front. This made him mad. He strutted about furiously, striking here and there with blows that were meant to kill. But he was sluggish and heavy, and his aim was poor. The twins fought with all their might. They pounded the giant on the stomach. They pounded him on the back, and their clubs struck him with a dull, sickening thud. Bunga shouted and taunted them about their weakness. He said, You are a wonderful man to be on both sides of me at the same time, but what good will it do you? I can hardly feel your blows. Hit me harder. Then he stood still, raised his arms, and let Inganag hit him for all he was worth. Hit me again, he shouted. I didn't feel that at all. Inganog hit him again and again and again. Now, said the giant, hit me first on one side and then on the other. And he spread his legs so that Inganog could run between them. Then Inganog and Enganog hit him, one after the other, in such quick succession that their blows seemed to fall at the same time. Bunga smiled and said, You are doing well. Keep it up. It helps me digest the pentecas. But all of a sudden, the pebbles inside the pentecas began to pain him. A look of anguish came over his face, and he said, Enough! Stop it! And when the twins did not stop, Bunga once more began to fight. The harder he fought, the more the pebbles pained him, and he really thought Anganog was hitting him hard enough to hurt. This frightened him, for never before had such a thing happened. The pain grew worse and worse, until at last, giant doubled up and fell writhing on the ground. His club rolled out of his hands and he groaned in agony. The next minute, the twins picked up his club and pounded Boar Bunga so hard on the stomach that he cried for mercy. I'll go, I'll go, he groaned. Stop, I'll do anything you want, I'll go. Inkanag said, call your cloud and I'll let you go. Then Bunga called for his cloud. The cloud lowered over the peak, and when it lifted, Bunga was gone. The cloud drifted away, and the sun shone again. And once more, the people of Kar enjoyed that happiness that had always been theirs. Inganog and Enganog were made king, and all the people of Kar are alive and happy today. Do you agree with Tall that's the best story that Nimsarnim told? Do you think it's going to open the door? Let's see. For some little time after the story was finished, the king and the queen and the courtiers sat staring at Nooms or Noom. They could not take their eyes off the man who had read such a wonderful story. Yet though all seemed intent on nothing but the storyteller, at the same time, they were listening for the golden door to open. But they heard nothing, for the door did not budge. At last, the king looked at the door. When he saw that it was still tight shut, he was disappointed and angry. He said to Noom Zornum, Your story was a good one. If you had told it instead of read it, I think that the door might have opened. You did not obey my orders, and now I must suffer without my son for another year. But you will suffer too. You must pay the penalty. Your head must come off. When Noom Zornum heard what King Tazarin said, he did not know what to do. He thought to himself, This serves me right. I never should have brought Tall with me. How can I save him now? He looked at Millie Tinkle as if she could help him out. But she was standing there dumbfounded with her eyes on the floor, for the last thing she had ever expected was that the door would not open. Then the old man said to the king, 
I have failed and I am willing to die. But before my beheaded, I should like to ask one thing of you. What is it? asked the king. That you put the crystal block back on my donkey's back and let her go where she wishes, said Noom Sarnum. I'll kill you both, said the king in his anger. One of you is as bad as the other. I want to die with my master, said Millie Tinkle, quite forgetting about Tall. You may, said the king. Then he turned to the guards and said, Take this man out and behead him. Take his donkey with him, too. I wish to see nothing more of either of them. As soon as the king spoke, three guards rushed forward. Two of them started to carry Noom Zornum out of the room, and the other one led Millie Tinkle. They did not touch the crystal block. They left it lying on the floor in front of the throne. But before they reached the door, the king shouted in his rage, Wait! Don't take him away until he has seen his crystal block smashed to bits before his own eyes. And so if you remember, Tall is hiding inside that crystal block. Noom Zarnum and Millie Tinkle tried to say something, but the guards would not let them speak. Then another guard was called, and he came forward with a sledgehammer to smash the crystal block. While Noom Zarnum and all the others looked on in breathless silence, the guard raised his hammer and brought it down with all his force on the crystal block. There was a crash. All the candles went out, and the room became dark. And above the murmur of many voices could be heard the king shouting, What's happened? Why did the candles go out? He had just finished these words when the golden door began to glow. As it glowed, one of the eyes in the golden head lit up so bright that it cast a beam of light across the room. Then slowly, little by little, the door swung open. And as it opened, the beam of light from the eye swept across the room until it shone on the spot where the crystal block had been smashed. There it stopped, casting its bright light on Tall, who sat among the broken bits of crystal. For a moment, no one said anything. No one breathed. And before the king could realize what had happened, the golden head spoke and said, there is your son. He has come back to you. He's talking about Tall. Then the queen shouted, It's our boy! And she rushed down to where Tall was sitting. The king followed behind her, forgetting his digni dignity and stumbling along as best as he could in all his robes. They took hold of Tall and kissed him and hugged him until he was almost smothered. And everyone else in the room crowded around as close as they could get. Meanwhile, the eye stopped shining, the door shut, and the candles began to burn again. So intent was everyone on the boy who came out of the crystal block that no one even thought to look behind the golden door. When they did think of it, it was too late. And though some of them tried to make it open again, it would not move. After his first joy at seeing the boy was over, the king called to the guards and made them bring Noom Zornum before him. He looked at the old man and asked, Did you bring this boy in? I did, said Noom Zornum. Where did he come from? asked the king. I brought him with me from a place called Martuna, said Noom Zornum. And he went on and told the king all that he knew about Tall. You did well, said the king. I'm sorry for being unkind. You and your donkey are free. After that, there was a great deal of talking and a great deal of confusion. And soon the word spread throughout Troom that the king's son had, been, had come back. So Tall turned out to be King Tazarin's son. He became the prince that he really was. All the storytellers were freed from prison. Noom Zornum was given a special job, and he and Millie Tinkle were given one of the best rooms in the palace. King Tazarin, now that he had his son back, became the good and kind man that he'd been before the prince disappeared. He ruled his people well and made sure that everyone was happy and taken care of. The first night that Tall was home with his mother and father, 
he told them all about Martuna. And when the king and queen heard how well he'd been treated in that village, they sent to Martuna and brought all the people to Trum. King Tazarin gave them houses and everything else to make them happy, and they lived as well as they deserved to live. Tall, Noom Zornum, and Millie Tinkle never forgot their trip to Trum. They still talk about it and laugh about the time that Tall became part giraffe. Millie Tinkle has become a little less argumentative, but not much. Today, Tall is king, and his title is King Tazarin II, the greatest king of Trum. So far, the golden door has never opened again, not even for Tall. And to this day, no one knows what is behind it. And the last picture that it shows is the door opening up with the light shining down on Tall to reveal that he was the son of the queen and king. And then it has that same picture that it has on the back of the book. I guess I did cry a little bit. I just love the end of this book so, so much and always makes me tear up a little bit. I hope you enjoyed Tall as much as I do. I love reading that to first graders every year. I find it something really special and a special experience that you'll know that anyone else in 1R will always get that same experience to listen to Tall at the end of the year. And we finished it just in time. Um, if you are interested in ever rereading Tall, I'm going to show you the cover and the, remind you of the author. It used to be out of print, but they've started making more of them. It's called Tall, His Marvelous Adventures with Noom or Noom. It's by Paul Fenimore Cooper. And um, as we now have finished it, I'm wondering which of our read-alouds you liked better. This year we read two big chapter books. We read Tall and we read the three Tum Tum and Nutmeg stories. Which one do you prefer and why? I always have such a hard time choosing, but I'd love to know your opinion. All right, see you later, first graders.